Rob Lockhart, and uh, I have uh, I'm the, well, that's me. Uh, there's two of you. I'm the creative director, which is a title I, came, I made up because I, I work for myself at a studio called Important Little Games. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about why educational games suck. Uh, even though I make them, so it's not a self-serving talk, maybe. Uh, so not all educational games are terrible. Uh, there are some gems out there. This is Oregon Trail. Here's SimCity 1. This is a, a pretty recent one called Do I Have a Right? Which is by Filament Games, where you are managing a, a constitutional law firm. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a game star mechanic where you're learning to design games. Weird. Meta. And then there's there's lots of good games out there that are educational, but they're like education isn't their main focus. Uh, so I'm sure you recognize all of those. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say like, but all games are educational, essentially. Like, they, you know, people have come to me and say, said, like, I learned English from playing Chrono Trigger, or like, uh, you know, I st got started learning Japanese or math or money management. Like, games have lessons to teach us uh, always, but uh, even the ones where you shoot people in the face. <laughs> um, so, what what does educational games mean? Uh, well, you damn well know what it means. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so fun is a signal that your brain is giving you that you're learning something. Um, and that, that's all well and good, but it's, it's, you're learning something that's evolutionarily useful. And evolution is kind of out of date at this point. Like, it's teaching you lessons that are useful to hunter-gatherer societies but uh, maybe not to you um, whose dad is a dentist or whatever. Uh, so uh, my rule of thumb is that it, like, when I talk about educational games, it's something that it teaches something that um, is useful to the world outside of the game. Does somebody do this for a living or as part of their job? Then, uh, or will they in the future when some other job exists that we don't, uh, can't imagine yet? Uh, in that case, it's probably that that's the class of educational games that I prefer to talk about, I guess. Uh, so, yes, all modern, well-designed games educate the player on how to play the game. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so all a game designer do, has to do to make a, a fantastic educational game is to, to bundle up the content and the gameplay in such a way that they're so inseparable that by teaching the player how to play the game, you're teaching them how, about the content. Uh, and, and then when they're playing the game, you know, after tutorial things, they're practicing the skill that you've taught them. Uh, and that, that's it. But it <coughs> sounds a lot easier than it is. Um, So that brings me to reason one why uh, educational games suck. Uh, design is hard, and it's so pretty much that's the same reason why most games suck. Uh, like what is it? Like ninety-nine percent of games suck. Uh, if you go on the app store, like pretty much every game on there sucks. <laughs> uh, but th those aren't the ones that rise to the top. Obviously, there's a cream. Uh, but uh, it's just as true for educational games, and perhaps more true because of um, this thing, that you're trying to do two things at once. You're trying to be educational and a game. Um, so this here is uh, pictures of Math Blasters, the app. Uh, it's one of my favorite examples to beat up on because uh, they, they have sort of two sections of the gameplay that alternate. So if you start out, you're on this like awesome hover cycle, and you're going through tubes, and you're shooting it, and like things are blowing up. It's all robots, so it's like, you know, not that 
you know, it's parrot friendly. You're not, you're not killing people. They're just like little robot drones. And then, uh, and then at a certain point you get to, oh, there's a boss fight. And this is what the boss looks like. Uh, so there's just a thing and you're doing math problems. Uh, and, and most of the, you know, it, it, they get progressively harder. This is maybe not the best uh, example. Some of them are like genuinely difficult to do in your head uh, in later levels. But nonetheless, the, the message you're sending the player is basically that uh, math is an interruption in your gameplay. Uh, so this is, this is uh, you know, it, it's essentially like a flashcard system with a game as a reward, is what it turns out to be, which is not totally worthless. Um, like flashcard systems are often very effective and game-based ones are more effective than regular ones, it's been shown. Uh, but still not the ideal situation uh, to be in for an educational game. Uh, so this game even uh, goes as far as to give you two different scores. Oh, wow. Yeah, so you know that the, the cohesion between like, the educational part and the game part is basically non-existent. Uh, there are some types of content that's easier to make games for than others, which is why basically all typing teaching games are fun. Uh, it's, it's really easy to like match up that mechanic with um, some fun stuff. This is Typing of the Dead. Uh, as long as it's well balanced, it's going to be a good game. Uh, and, and typing teaching games are often cited as uh, some of the best. Uh, reason two, they have this reputation for being for little kids. And if you go to the App Store right now, this is the educational category of the App Store. I got it yesterday. Uh, and most of these things are for little kids. And you'll find that uh, in general on every platform, uh, early childhood games like are prevalent. There, There's lots of them. And they're also pretty good. They serve their the purpose very well. Um, and, but when you go to, uh, you know, when someone of our age or, or a teen or a tween goes to an app store and they see this, they're like, educational games are not for me. They're, they're dumb. They're for little kids. Uh, and they're very valuable for elite development, but uh, Developers don't want to break this mold because it's easier to, to go through a, a well-trodden path, essentially. Like, you know, if, if you label yourself an educational games developer, the easiest thing to do is make some early childhood games. Uh, so then the next reason is they're for parents. Uh, so the people who buy educational games are far and away, mo more often than not, not the people who are playing the games. So uh, you can make something that, uh, and Mimi Ito basically wrote a whole book about this, uh, that it catalogs the sort of edutainment uh, phenomenon of the late 80s, early 90s, where uh, lots and lots of educational software came out and basically tailored was tailored to parents. Uh, Take a look. This is a this is a modern uh, educational game uh, box. So, talking words backwards. Take a look. What, what, other than the word fun here, how do we know that this is fun? Uh, well, there's the frogs are smiling. They are happy. So, but there's no. You don't know what you're playing here. Backwards. Essentially, what this box is selling is a happy kid who's also learning. And that's what you sell to a parent and not to a child. Like, the child doesn't care about, like, happy kids and letters floating around. They want to know, like, what are they actually doing? Uh, it could be a, game, a, a great game inside. Uh, I've never played this game. Uh, but it, it doesn't really matter in terms of sales uh, how good it is. Uh, the, the crazy thing about this whole scenario is that if it's bad, uh, then parents, like imagine yourself as an anxiety-ridden parent with lots of disposable income. All of your, chi all of your friends' kids are amazing, they're learning Mandarin and stuff like that, 
and uh, you want to make sure that your kid keeps up. So you buy them some educational software, and they, you put the kid in front of it, and they're like, this is boring, and they're just doing terrible. Oh no, my kid's a I need to get some more software. And so, so that's what actually happens. It becomes like this weird feedback loop where uh, parents just buy more and more stuff as an intervention to when they, and they place the blame for bad content on their own kids. Uh, okay, so here's another reason. Uh, good machines versus bad machines. Uh, so here's... Uh, good machines versus bad machines. Uh, <laughs> parents like iPads and hate consoles. Consoles make their children violent and they uh, steal their time away and waste it. Uh, iPads are an educational tool, essentially, in the mind of this, the current zeitgeist. Uh, I, I, in the past, like, the PCs were also in this category of, of um, something that parents could trust, they could put their kid in front of and, and uh, be secure in the knowledge that they were going to learn something over that experience. But uh, recently, like uh, internet porn and Craigslist ads have kind of tainted the reputation in the minds of parents of, of, of PC. So, like, uh, tablets and iDevices are, are kind of the ally. And this is problematic for us as developers um, because uh, a lot of, I mean, we are, might be great counterexamples, but a lot of talent in, in the games industry is kind of focused on the console market. Um, and, you know, if, if there's no market for educational games, that means most game developers are not working on it and probably never will be. Uh, let's look at an early console educational game. This is Mario's early years. Um, there's like, uh, uh, Mario learns letters, uh, numbers, and Mario learning letters, and uh, they weren't so good, apparently. Uh, this one got a 2.725 out of 5, this one got a, which is weirdly specific, and this one got a 2.95 out of 5. Uh, not crazy surprising, except that these are ratings from Nintendo Power Magazine. Uh, so, uh, there's also sort of a, uh, a history that builds on itself, that um, if, you, if you have an early educational game on a console that is terrible and flops, then um, that becomes a precedent that's really hard to escape from. Like, um, the reason that every movie is a superhero movie right now. Uh, if, if you make a movie that's, you know, about uh, relationships or something, uh, and it flops, then <coughs> relationship movies flop, according to data. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and this is just what I was saying before about how uh, PCs are kind of in the middle right now. Uh, yeah, this is the <laughs> the last big reason I'll give, which is um, me <laughs> right now talking about how much educational games suck. Uh, so it's a self fulfilling prophecy essentially. Like people um, talk about how much they suck, which means. Developers like you are like, oh, they, uh, I would never want to make something like that because I don't want to make games that suck. And then uh, also people who fund games, they don't want to spend too much money on games that they know are going to suck because all educational games suck. So they don't spend enough money to make it good. And then they suck. Uh, so, uh, sorry, apologies <laughs> to all of my colleagues. But uh, I have a fair amount of confidence, confidence that uh, it's going to be different this time. Right now, we're kind of in uh, a renaissance for educational games. Uh, I'm looking at you, John Murphy. Uh, so a bunch of us are, are working on making the situation better. Um, so this is one of those people, Katie Salen. She worked, she worked on that, that fourth good educational game that I showed you, GameStar Mechanic. Um, she's working on her foundation. is working on SimCity EDU. 
and um, founded these quest schools that are very uh, game-based learning sort of focused. <coughs> uh, here is Jesse Schill, um, Shell Games, CMU, ETC, uh, FBI, CIA, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just, uh, he's an ed educational-ish developer, he makes transformational games, um, and he, he has a knack for sort of making uh, like a childlike experience, which is really awesome. Uh, this is Robin Hunnica. I don't know how to spell it. Is it Hunnicky? Thank you. He probably knows her. Uh, but she's she just made this company phenomena that's um, poised possibly to make some transformational games, possibly about um, fitness or other sort of uh, self improvement uh, topics for youngsters, etc. Uh, so they're not locked into doing transformational games, but it seems like she's very interested in that category. And uh, this is, uh, you all know this guy. Uh, his company made this game, although that seems like a weird association. Like we're used to thinking about uh, a very different type of game for uh, Double Fine. And then uh, sort of, I don't know if you can even see, this is Filament Games, it says, that's all it says. Uh, and they're a, they're a studio in Madison that's made some of the greatest things of, of in recent memory. Uh, so like Reach for the Sun and that game I showed you before the, uh, where you're taking control of a constitutional law for uh, really awesome stuff. Uh, and then another piece of sort of uh, hope for the educational games movement right now, or I don't know to call it a movement, but uh, this this generation of educational games is uh, that nonprofits are in there. So like uh, uh, MIT Education Arcade, Institute of Play, uh, a bunch of different uh, nonprofits are sort of also working in the same space and and have the genuine interest. They're not out to make money, so they have the genuine interests of the the final user, the the player, the learner in mind. Uh, oh, I, I wanted to plug, I, I hope I want to join that last bit of group of slides of, with uh, those folks who are, who are really uh, changing the landscape for educational games. But this is what I'm working on right now, it's called Codemancer, and you uh, have to learn programming to win, because <laughs> programming is magic in this world, and you're uh, a student wizard. So, it's me again. Uh, that's all I had to say about uh, why educational games suck and how we're kind of fixing it. So, I'm open to questions now. Most games are sold to parents. I'm wondering now, are there any educational games that are designed to be played simultaneously by parent and child? Like, I know we have books that are done for that, and there are like, kids' TV that have adult jokes stuck in and stuff like that. Yeah. So I don't even try that for games. Um, there are games that are made that can be played that way. Uh, and, and one of the things that um, Jim G, who is uh, like a scholar who um, studies the educational potential of games um, and game-like learning experiences. Uh, one of his examples that, that got him thinking about that was um, playing a game with his kid. I'm so bad at the names of things. Um, do you know the, oh, Pikmin, that's the name of it. He was playing Pikmin with his kid and, and Basically, the kid was exhibiting all of the um, traits of a scientist, essentially, in exploring the rule space of Pikmin. Like, you know, can you do these things? Will this, is this an effective strategy? And like, can you demolish these walls, or are they programmed to be invulnerable, or like, s stuff like that, that you have to test when you're playing a game. And um, so, those are definitely amazing experiences, as far as like a game that is designed specifically to be played parent and child, 
Uh, I'm not really aware of any, although I know of some researchers who are like forcing parents and children to play that way and then studying like um, how much more beneficial that is. And, and it, it has been proven to be statistically uh, a good thing because, I mean, it may be just true of all shared media experiences between parent and child that behavior models pass from the parent to the child because they, you know, see their parents' reaction to things that are happening outside of like a real experience and they can test um, like their social emotional uh, responses in, in a safe space. But uh, no, I don't know of any names that are made for that. Yes? Do you, because I work for this company called Noggin Labs and we do custom learning and we're We've done like gamification stuff and we're kind of testing waters for games to be made educationally, but that's pretty much going to have to come from the clients because we're not a software company. Are you, is that game that you're making, is that from, like are you making it for a client or are you just making it to sell? I'm just making it to sell that particular one. I also do client work and there is some. People do want educational games made for sure. And, and they're comfortable with, like how long will lead time be typically? Like our clients, we deliver stuff within six months. Kind of uh, game. Well, it'd be a shitty game. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I guess maybe that's part of the problem of why educational games suck is that um, a lot of the times clients are not people who are familiar with the game development process. So you have to like explain to them that games, making games, is hard. And just because you saw that news story about the like six-year-old who made a game, uh, doesn't mean that like you're going to be able to do it really fast and, and make it good. Um, so, so there is like some hand-holding for that client process every single time. But um, it, it, the length of time for development really depends on like how big the scope of the learning goals is um, often. Like, it's something that like I, I made a, uh, I collaborated on a game that um, teaches the, the properties of multiplication, like the you know, associated property and stuff like that. And, and um, because there's only basically four things you have to get across, and they're very like declarative things, but, and, the, and, and they can explore those things, it, you just have to make one system basically that, um, that has all those features. So um, kind of in the style of like, like the world of Goo, for example, is a really great exploration of like um, tension and compression and, and, and like making trust structures and things like that. And as on a basic level, like you're crafting only one game mechanic there. It's just like you attach goo to other goo and it makes trust structures um, pretty naturally. So you can imagine that being a very small scope. Like the, the actual world of goo has like a lot of complication on top of that that, that makes it a, a, you know, a larger project maybe, but you, you could probably pare it down to something that's within the scope, depending on the learning. So you were talking about how most educational games are marketed toward parents for kids, and, that, and so the idea I kind of get from that is that most educational also games employers. I should have said is that, that employers are. It, it's basically the same phenomenon. Is employers want their employees to learn something, so they'll buy um, to education software. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, and so I guess I'm focused more on the, the non-employer or non-employee side of things, but. Um, it sounds like most education games are made for kids, generally like high school level or lower. And is there, I guess I'm wondering, like, is there a sort of market that's maybe, maybe uh, an extra space or something that we've tried or not have tried as an industry to, to kind of create educational games for adults uh, and for just just older people uh, in general, just higher than the high school level that are actually worked out or more Do you know of anything? I, I really don't. Uh, I wish I could say I did. Do you have it? Um, it sort of depends. Like, I feel like when you're marketing an educational game toward like an older audience, it's not exactly a, a practical skill so much as something that someone finds interesting. Like, I played this Flash game. I'm not sure if they went in it deciding this will be an educational game, but it's a Flash game called Socrates Jones, Pro Philosopher. Oh yeah. And I feel um, I feel like. I didn't do much research afterwards because I'm a busy guy, but I feel like I learned a lot about schools of philosophy by playing this game, the idea of debating and critical thinking, 
and I feel like it was a game designed for an older audience. And then there's also other games like uh, the Super Energy Apocalypse, where it's an RTS where it teaches you about alternative energy sources, and you have to fend off monsters that eat pollution. And yeah, it's a zany little game, but I, again, I feel like it's a fun thing targeted toward an older audience that has some educational value to it, and like stems from an educational, like, like, it's sort of like the designer said, what's something educational that's also awesome that could be more awesome by being a video game? And, and I think, like, uh, one last example, although it was directed towards kids, uh, there was that Kickstarter that Bill Nye was trying to get going, where it was where you played as a bird and it taught you about aerodyna aerodynamics. Yeah. That's um, that project did continue. That, yeah. Even though it didn't get funded. It yeah. Did. Oh, it, that's good. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but um, there's another one of these foundations, like the Institute of Play, that that took it up as a project and, and, and kept running with it. Uh, that's good. Enough. There's those uh, brain training sort of Yeah, if you want to count lumosity, too. maybe. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a lot of like, uh, there's the transformational process. games for adults. Um, so like, um, uh, like the uh, the drone pilot game or like the McDonald's game. That, um, they're, they're like more persuasive and or maybe behavior altering. Even um, um, Dumb Ways to Die, have you heard of that? Yeah. So they, they made an app of Dumb Ways to Die uh, where it basically it doesn't teach you anything, but it but apparently it actually dropped uh, accidents around um, train stations by 20% in the, in the Australia, uh, which is where they initiated this program. And it's just like showing you, you know, these are all dumb ways die like it's embarrassing if you, you know, <laughs> do something so stupid and get killed by a train and and so so there's a lot of you know behavior altering games geared at adults and then the rest I, I think are mostly like employer initiated and, or or institutionally initiated let's say because you know either they want their their consumers to be educated in something that will you know, help them make an informed decision about their product, or they want their employees to uh, learn something so they can do their jobs better. I suppose we just don't think about them as educational games usually, because not portrayed that way. Yeah, and then of course there's those those like stealth learning games like Civilization that are geared you know, for adults. They teach a lot, but they kind of don't get credit for it because it's not their main thing. They're also very entertaining. <laughs> Actually, on that same track, what about stuff like? Really hardcore simulations, like uh, well, even like slightly less so, Kerbal Space Program, mm -hmm. like learning a lot about how you plot orbits and courses and stuff like that, and Lagrange points and all kinds of other things that yeah. are a lot more advanced than you get, say, in a high school classroom, you know. But uh, and it would apply at like a, a collegiate level. Or like that. Yeah, that's a really good example. There's an experience I had recently playing um, this game called Octodad. Uh, and I was playing co-op with my dad. He had just come by for a little while, and we decided to play together because we had that option. Yeah, he had that option. And I gave him the hardest part, the legs. Um, and I was pointing to him with my, with the arm, like, go this way, go this way, go this way. But he was having such a good time because the environment it supported was like, okay, so it's playing with dad. Yeah, like that whole situation was encompassed because he. It would be even better if your dad is actually an octopus. <laughs> <laughs> I know he's, he's not. Explains <laughs> <laughs> uh, why my limbs are so long. Um, but that like experience is, it, like a lot of Lego games have been known to be played with families uh, because it's just Lego at, at its core is meant for the family. It's not meant for like specific age range. Sort of, kind of is marketing wise. So. Uh -huh. But uh, especially with Duplo. But it's uh, yeah, it's just kind of the general tool. Yeah, and you can hop in. And the same for like Minecraft. Like there's a there's kind of a subclass of teachers right now that are that are way into these sort of um, tool environment uh, games like Portal and Minecraft, and they're 
using them in classrooms, which is what we do. Patrick? I think we argue that uh, Papers, Please is an educational tool. Absolutely. In fact, Games for Change last year was run by Lucas Pope. Not, by, not for, games for, not for uh, Papers, Please, for Republic of Times, but yeah. yeah. Okay, so it looks like that's all the time we have. Thank you so much, guys.